Okay, right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, firstly, many thanks for taking the time out today to join us for our webinar session. Uh, my name is Curran. I'm the Partnership Officer for the Surrey Safeguarding Adults Board. Um, as part of my role, we are developing ways in which we engage and communicate with agencies across the county. And delivering our webinar series is just one of the many ways we'd like to engage with you all uh, and disseminate information and raise awareness around safeguarding issues and priorities. Uh, today, we are joined by Sarah Billingham, who is our Community Response Officer for Hourglass Surrey. Uh, Sarah has kindly offered her time today to, to kind of give us an insight into some of the services that Hourglass offer um, and an insight into preventing the abuse of older people. Uh, we will be recording today's session, so if you do miss anything Sarah mentions, you will be able to find the full recording on our website and we will offer the opportunity for you to ask questions and give feedback using the Lynch, sorry, the link which we will shortly put in the uh, webinar chat bar. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sarah who will begin presenting. Thank you. Thanks so much um, for introducing me, Karen. Um, I will just put my slides up in a second, but um, just to say I'll also, uh, well, in fact, I've already given you the um, uh, the presentation, so if that, that can be shared with anybody. Um, so uh, feel free to, to kind of do that. Uh, but, but anyway, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming along. It's uh, great to have the opportunity to spread the news, really, about our glass being in Surrey, although I've actually been here for a year now. Um, part of our issue really is that um, we, we find it very difficult to um, sort of connect with people. My role as community response officer is kind of a two pronged thing. It's to spread the word, connect with people, set up referral pathways um, and just really reach out to provide training um, and things such as this where just kind of, sort of trying really to explain a little bit about what um, what our class is all about. So let me just see if I can get my PowerPoint up and running. We did practice this earlier, so hopefully <laughs> it will work. It was a window, isn't it? That's right. I'm on standby if you need me, Sarah. Um, right, it's not. Oh, here we go. think this is going to be right so can you see that everybody that has come up lovely Thanks, Sarah. great all right well thank you so much um for having me and just to say that i'm obviously the re community response officer for surrey um and hourglass actually we're a national we're a national charity but we do have a presence in the southeast so we're kind of spreading the word around really um, to people such as yourself. So we're uh, the only charity actually that's dedicated to calling time on the harm, abuse and exploitation of older people nationally. Uh, we're quite a small charity, there's only 30 of us in the whole charity. We're, as I say, spread over um, the whole of the nation, all four countries. Um, but really, uh, the only data really that we have that we can share with you with regards to the amount of people that do experience domestic abuse in the older population is that we know there are about two million people um, that we have recorded um, nationally. Um, it doesn't really bear out with what we're trying to get hold of locally because a lot of this goes unreported. Um, part of our problem really is that we don't really know what uh, elder abuse looks like or people generally don't really know what elder abuse looks like. It's one of those funny things. It's a very um, complicated sort of ethereal thing that keeps moving. The goalposts keep moving. So part of the issue really, which I'm trying to sort of help people to understand today, is just how complicated it is and just how, um, how changeable it is. So really my question to you today is please can you set aside how you conventionally think of domestic abuse. I think a lot of people have a um, an image such as the one that's on your screen, which is the NCDVs um, on their on their homepage um, of kind of like the younger person with bruises that that seems to be how people uh, the image that sort of springs to mind. Um, and that's the first thing that I found really when I went online to look for some idea of some images to share with you today to give you an idea. So I had a bit of a 
browse through Google Images to try and find some um, sense of something that would portray what I believe the domestic abuse in the older person uh, looks like. And this is the best that I could find. Um, none of it is really particularly um, typical because it does vary so much. So um, although we do work with uh, partner on partner abuse within the work that we do within the over age, um, everyone that we work with is over the age of 60, um, but only a small percentage is really falls into that category. So the majority of our work really is around what you'll see on the screen in front of you. So it's very varied. Um, you know, you, you've got the, um, the, the, the care home type abuse. You've got, obviously, there's a lot of, about 50% of the clients we work with have disabilities. Uh, but the two bottom images really best, I would say, best typify what elder abuse is all about. Because basically, most of what we see is to do with financial incentivization, incentivization of the perpetrators. So of our um, casework, um, believe it or not, about 30% of the perpetrators that we have experience of through our casework that we do and our helpline calls, 30% come in as being the perpetrators, the son. Uh, slightly lower for the daughter, um, 24% with the daughter, but um, th I think because it's so difficult to get hold of data and because it's such a sort of a, a, a complicated issue to describe and identify, um, I think that that will be vastly underreported, so uh, it's probably a lot higher than that. But we do also see care home abuse, um, and as, as I said earlier, about half of our work is involving somebody with a disability, usually very complicated multi-disabilities. Uh, and the average um, age of our clients is um, 75. So uh, uh, although we work with people from the age of 60 upwards, uh, as people age, we find that the abuse increases, largely for reasons of um, more stress within the relationships. And also as people age, maybe the people with financial um, incentivization, they're kind of the eyes on the prize. They don't want their inheritance spent. So we, we see a lot of that, a lot of um, lasting power of attorney abuse and uh, will pressure to change wills. Um, just to give you a little bit of um, data without going too heavy on it. Um, so all, um, all of our clients we work with over the age of 60. Um, and as you'll see from the Safe Lives data, everything changes really when people re reach 61. And all of a sudden the rates massively go up for domestic abuse in the older population. So um, it rises significantly for abuse from an adult family member up to 44%. Um, and even for intimate partners. So even for the intimate partner abuse, that goes up after the age of 60. Um, only 27% will try and leave. Um, very many complicated issues around that, largely due, due to being homeowners or it's, it's happening within the home. Um, and also 32% are likely to be living with their perpetrator. Um, we see a lot of uh, adult children living within the family home, uh, maybe sort of co-caring co going on. We see a lot of um, elderly people who are being abused, still being, being very protective over their, their younger family member, but, um, you know, it's still abuse. Um, and as I said to you before, nearly, nearly half have a disability, usually very, very complicated multi-disability situations. Um, so on the domestic, I just wanted to really show you this. Um, it's just a, a definition of the, with the domestic abuse, what, what constitutes domestic abuse. And I've just highlighted all it has to be is that people are personally connected to each other. So a lot of people, there's a kind of a misunderstanding around the fact that it's partner on partner. Um, there, there's a lot of robust law around child protection which is why a lot of the there's a lot of support for women out there generally um, and a lot of funding for women out there generally. But actually, as people age, it tends to fall much more equally gendered wise. And we see 
pretty much a 50 50 split of people who are uh, experiencing the domestic abuse. So I've just got a little bit of uh, a couple of slides from our helpline. So as I mentioned before, we have a helpline which runs 24 seven, which anybody can call, uh, whether it's a client, a you know, somebody that's being abused themselves or whether it's a service provider. So any of you today that wanted a little bit of advice could call our helpline and I'll put the number at the end of the presentation. But this is um, a pie chart basically of what we see in the data that comes into us, so types of abuse. So as you'll see, the uh, biggest proportion of, of domestic abuse is uh, financial abuse. Um, usually it's a mix actually, because there's a lot of co coercive control around the, around the um, uh, financial abuse. Um, and it can be anything from, I mean, I, I spoke to somebody a couple of weeks ago and her home had been her granddaughter and his husband had moved in, her husband had moved in and they had managed to get the grandmother to put the deeds to the house in the granddaughter's and husband's name. Um, and even though she, the, the grandmother was, knew that it didn't feel right, she still went along with it because they were living with her and they were caring for her. So, um, yeah, very, very difficult, complicated situations, as I said earlier. So really difficult to identify. I'm not sure um, what you'll think of the location of abuse for people, but generally, um, I think because it's very newsworthy when um, there's some sort of care home abuse happens, and I know there was an incident in... Um, Rygate, there was a, a care home that was in the news a couple of years ago. But as our data uh, indicates, actually, although we do see a little bit of care home abuse, by far and large, the abuse is happening within the walls of their own home. Um, I mean, pretty much all my clients I've worked with have, have been uh, abused at home. So I just sort of thought I'd try and shed a little bit of light on who these people are, that or who these kind of mysterious people are that are victims of this abuse, because, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, well, why don't they leave? Or there's a lot of uh, support out there for older people. They're very much kind of hooked, on, hooked in by, by health. Um, but I've just got a couple of very brief case studies to give you, just so that we can, I can kind of give you a flavour of the sorts of things that we see. So Christina is um, has, has been a client of mine. Her husband has dementia uh, and is an, an alcoholic. Uh, there's been very complicated trying to get the level of his dementia identified because they apparently can only do the um, the testing of the brain, uh, the scan of the brain, or whatever they do. They can only do that when he hasn't had alcohol. So it was a very difficult situation whereby even though she'd been abused for many, many years, um, she, kept, she kept blaming the dementia, um, was utterly able to cope, but still wanted to stay. But there was a lot of abuse around him driving and wanting to, um, him wanting to drive because he wanted to get his alcohol and sort of the expectation was that Christina was to somehow hide the keys and prevent him from driving. So she she needed some support from us for that. So that was kind of her kind of situation. Um, and then we have David, um, again, a very complicated situation. So he lives, he lives or lives with a, um, his wife who has Huntington's disease. Um, fairly well gone so she's she's fairly incapacitated I don't think she's speaking nowadays um, but the adult daughter is the perpetrator the adult daughter doesn't live at home in fact there are two adult daughter perpetrators but one in particular a lot of pressure financially to change the will um, and the you know the the onus really has been on David to provide personal care for um for her and trying to sort of keep the daughter out I think so on contact with David we managed to get some support for David for his wife's Huntington's disease and it was only really through speaking to that charity that some light had been shed on the daughter's scenario because 
the daughter, the main perpetrator daughter was, um, her, her three of her children had temporarily gone into care and she do a lot of random things like turn up at the family home with her children and just kind of stay, stay for a month, but whilst perpetrating abuse towards her father. Um, the mother actually um, didn't really, wasn't really subjected to the abuse. Um, so we did a lot of work around um, trying to get him some support around the Huntington's disease, care support um, assessments done and carers assessments done. Um, and also we, we encourage the family to reach out to the children regarding their own diagnoses because the Huntington Society was sus sus suspected that perhaps this had um, sort of gone down onto the children, if you like. Uh, so that was David um, and a random helpline caller um, who actually I spoke to a couple of days ago. So a lady phoned up about her father who had dementia or has dementia and um, the mother is absolutely hates him, she, she told me, um, absolutely refuses to leave, but um, he thinks that they're really happily married and he's a very gentle man and, and he doesn't want to do anything to upset his wife. But as the years have gone by, she's always sort of been determined that she would never work with, uh, sorry, she would never um, look after anyone with dementia. So she according to the daughter that called in she absolutely hates him and she just wants him gone uh so the daughter and other siblings are sort of struggling really with how best to care for their dad because she's preventing uh carers from coming into the house so he's recently been in hospital um they thought he had an infection but in fact it was just dehydrating uh, dehydration and um he ha he hadn't been eating properly as well. So a care package was put together for him on the condition of his release from hospital. But as soon as he went home, the um, mother was basically started abusing the caregivers. Um, there was a lot of racially motivated abuse of the caregivers as well. So much so that the family member felt the need to put the covert camera in the bedroom um, uh, just to say it wasn't because she was suspicious of the caregivers it was she she knew it was the mother so so um you know so very very complicated um scenarios it's not really as straightforward if you think along the lines of what I call the more conventional domestic abuse um where you get the generally speaking it's the male on female abuse, which then affects the children with a lot of coercive control, and then he leaves or, you know, they, they part ways and then the abuse escalates due to the separation and you get all that post-separation abuse that comes in. So the work that we do is really not like that in as far as there are kind of no two typical clients that we work with. They are so vastly different. Um, that I think you'll probably struggle yourselves to actually identify, um, you know, what 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 whether it's abuse or not. I mean, I work on the helpline to kind of help fill in sicknesses and things like that. And more often than not, when people phone in, it's a family member that's concerned, and they always start off by saying, um, "I don't know whether this is anything, but you know, I'm you know." I, I hope I'm not jumping to conclusions, but um, but I would suggest to you today, if the one thing you take away really is that if your gut instinct's telling you it's abuse, it's very likely that it is. Um, and, you know, as I say, there's no one size fits all, which is what makes it so difficult to identify. So I'll give you some sort of typical characteristics um, of what we tend to see. Um, again, it's, you know, it can be all of them, it can be none of them, it can even be something that isn't even on the list. Um, so basically, older victims, um, I don't know, because of their era that they grew up in, I suppose, they don't really recognise what's happening as abuse, or maybe they've been in denial for years about the fact that it's abusive behaviour. Um, 
it, similarly, I suppose, to parents who, you know, with young children, and if one of the children are kind of naughty or something, they're, they're very quick to, you know, say, well, you know, I know what he's really like. He's not really like that. He's such a nice, gentle person, really. Well, that dynamic really never changes. And so when you get the adult child living within the family home, that's abusive. It's no different with, with the older um, victim of abuse will use the same sort of, um, you know, descriptions. It's like, oh, well, it's not him. It's the alcohol or, um, you know, they, 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 they've got a heart of gold, really, you know, and I need to look after them. Um, they're very reluctant to talk about it. I think also when it's abuse of a fam from a family member, from a, particularly from a child, which does tend to be the majority of what we see, it's embarrassing. You know, they're reluctant to talk about it. They don't want the shame of discussing their private business with some young whippersnapper from, you know, adult services or something that probably maybe isn't old enough to have children themselves. So they're, they're very closed in that way. They they find it difficult to talk about it as well as the fact that they can't kind of can't quite pin pin it down um very often they just want to um get help for their adult child um they don't know about the help that's available they often don't use internet um things change laws change and they kind of they don't keep up to date with with what's what's available so they don't really know what they're asking for. They can't really pin it down in the same way. It's very difficult as a service pro provider to pin down what it is. Um, they equally have have find that very difficult. Uh, very often there's a mix of health and or mobility needs in there. Um, family and friends can be. Well, unsupportive, but probably believe themselves to be being supportive because, um, you know, again, they they see the family from the inside and, you know, oh, you know, this is just one of his moments or she's just uh, being difficult. Something must have happened. And, you know, I'm sure it will be fine next week sort of thing. Um, so family and friends at that stage in somebody's life aren't really going to sit them down and say, I think you're being abused. Um, it just isn't something that really happens. Um, as people age, obviously their vitality diminishes. Um, they kind of almost on the slippery slope that that they can't see anything going better, uh, any better in the future, and it's all going one way. So they just kind of almost give up. They're very isolated. Uh, a lot of them rely on their family members for connection with the outside world, whether it's, you know, using the phone or anything like that. Um, they're, you know, even getting services, getting access to services, you know, they might need a gardener. Likelihood is that a, one of the family members would sort of line that up for them. And if that family member doesn't want them spending their money on the garden, then, you know, you get the gatekeeping comes in. Um, obviously, with caring, needs that leads to massive additional layers of stress um and a big one really the dynamics rapidly change i mean a good week we'll we'll have we have referrals into us having somebody reach the end of their tether and then by the time the referrals come through to us and we call somebody and manage to get hold of them oh no he's all right now it's fine everything's gone back to normal without them really understanding that actually what is normal is on a bit of a trajectory to become worse as, as time goes by, as, as they age. Older people, they're more easy to manipulate. Um, as I've said, they, the decline of vitality. Uh, and also, we don't really know anything about them. It's very difficult for us to get funding for things because we, we don't they don't fill in fill forms um, and the stats are not really available um, for us to be able to help them because in order to um, 
any for any any charity to get money to support people you need to be able to prove that you can support them and that there are people out there that need support so it's really really challenging for us so just go through some of the barriers that some people will possibly see but again this isn't a, an infinite li list it's you you'll know of other barriers that you know i haven't experienced so big one is shame I mean, that whole thing, especially when you've got the adult child living with the family home, shame is such a big one for them. And just even understanding how you can approach them, being sensitive to that is, is quite a big thing for them. So often they have absolutely no idea what to do. So they just don't do anything. That's quite common, actually. Um, that's kind of what Christina was doing, you know, with her, the case study I showed you earlier with her husband with dementia and the dementia was getting worse. The alcoholism was getting worse, but she kind of didn't know what to do. She didn't want to leave. So she just kind of stayed and she just carried on hiding the keys from him. So that was creating more and more risk to her because he was getting more and more enraged as time went by. A lot of them are frightened, you know, especially when it's a, um, the more female oriented ones, uh, more of them really, are, they've lived with somebody since they were 16. I often get people go, oh, we've been together since, you know, we were at school, you know, and, and they're really absolutely petrified. They've never lived on their own. Habits have sort of developed over their whole lifetime, keeping the peace. Um, uh, uh, just it's very um, unusual actually to while I think of it to ever work with somebody that's newly with a perpetrator they tend to be relationships that have gone on for decades I don't think I've ever in my experience working at Hourglass I ever actually come across anybody that's with a new partner which obviously with the younger victims of domestic abuse you do see that so they've had a lifetime of keeping the peace and trying to make the family work. And, you know, it's hard for them to change the habits, really, you know. Um, this is a, they're, they're quite slippery. So um, what they'll often do is they will, you know, on a bad day, they'll be happy to talk about themselves. You know, they'll be honest with you and they'll tell you the truth about what's happened and everything. But if they're having a better day or they don't, you know, back to the shame and they don't want to be talking about it or it's just embarrassing, they sort of flip into this parent mode or spouse mode and, oh, no, it's fine, actually. And, you know, so so they're quite slippery in as far as um, I think with younger people, because you've got the child protection issue with young families, that they're, they're less able to hide the fact that it's going on whereas as people age it's much more easy for them to just kind of fob people off really um yeah I mean I get a lot of deflection of blame onto others I get a lot of people saying oh well if only the neighbor would stop reporting my son to the police you know we wouldn't have all this stress in the ha in the home and then um you know everything would be fine um so that's that's a big one and also it means that they don't have to face the reality of what they're experiencing. There's often co-caring. So we see a lot of older older adult child living at home with, with the parent or parents. And there's multiple issues going on for both part sides of this. So the alleged perpetrator will have um, potentially, uh, sometimes they have care needs themselves. Uh, maybe sometimes there's alcohol involved or alcohol abuse or drug abuse. Um, but obviously the health needs of the victims is, you know, quite a big thing for the for the victims. Um, they're very reluctant to criminalise their beloved family members. And I think if I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm referring to alleged perpetrators as perpetrators to you, but I would, wouldn't do that to the clients I work with, I would always talk, you know, about their their lovely son or, you know, um, they love them, you know, and, and the only kind of way you can have access to listening to them really is to um, 
take that on and, and understand how, how much they love. They love their family members or need them. A lack of confidence as they get older, um, fears over not being believed, that's cultural as well. I think they, they, they've probably never heard of domestic abuse. They probably don't really understand it and certainly probably think it's for younger people, um, you know, with, with their partner. Uh, and then obviously not forgetting the fluctuating capacity that can be overwhelming for them. Um, inability to access services, as I've said before, um, often the victim doesn't see harm as abuse. They often they can't leave because it's their home. And certainly, as I said to you before, a a nearly a third of, of, the, of the adult son um, and 24% adult daughter are the perpetrators of the abuse and very often they live with them in the family home and they're very powerful you know and they 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 the 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 adult child has choices they, they can work you know obviously when people age they can't work anymore they might be retired they don't go out um so you know and apart from all of these things on here they're absolutely petrified they're petrified of services um and they really, the, the, the truth change. The truth changes. They what, what to them is the truth. One week will be something another week, and so it's very difficult for a service provider to sort of pin them down on the fact that actually this is abusive behaviour. As I said to you before, the dynamics shift and change is like quicksand. Working with the older population with domestic abuse is really really challenging. So, and then obviously some barriers, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but the um, some of the barriers to seeking support are actually the service providers themselves inadvertently, which we'll talk about in more detail. So some of the common examples of abuse that we see, um, this is really difficult when you've got one family member that's a perpetrator and the extended family are kind of involved because they know something's going on but the perpetrator can very often be quite attentive. You know, they want to protect their interest in the family home, um, the, or the finances, they, they, it's control. They want control. So they will want to take their parent or family member to doctor's appointments and things like that. And often they'll stay in the room because they don't want a disclosure. So it's very difficult to identify who the perpetrator is when the perpetrator can sometimes can come across as being, you know, really quite attentive and supportive. Um, there's a lot of taking advantage of short term memory difficulties. We see people that want to stay in their home. We see that, you know, when the costs start coming in for 24 hour home care, uh, one lady cited £11,000 a month to keep her elderly mother-in-law at home. And obviously, um, a care home is cheaper. So sometimes you get pressure to, not only pressure, pressure to change lasting power of attorney or will, but also pressure to go into a care home. So um, we see an awful lot of unauthorised withdrawals from current accounts. Um, as I say, I've seen a sale of a home um all this online account stuff is bewildering really for the older population so they kind of just you know here's the, here's the bank card um go and get me what i need and yeah 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 that's fine you can buy yourself some cigarettes you know while you're there sort of thing um but that does get abused um and some people don't even know how to get hold of a statement they have no idea how much money's in their current account um, yeah, I mean, sort of control of the care or support is is quite a big one, you know, like, oh, no, you can't have a gardener or, you know, um, that, you know, a particular care provider might be more expensive than another, or they might want to save money because it's their inheritance they're protecting. And so, oh, no, no, that's fine. We'll care for her ourselves uh, as a family. And then, um, you know, this is where severe neglect comes comes in um, with the helpline call that came in the other day with the lady that phoned in with the two elderly parents and the and her mother was abusing her father 
um, part of the problem with that was that the carer eventually they had a carer coming in in the morning to change him put him in a, a, um, a pad uh, for in the morning but during the day there was no caregiver there and mum wasn't going to be doing it so the daughter went round there in the evening one night and he he'd been in the same pad all day and he was completely soaked through so um that's that's a different and then of course that's easily deniable oh no whoops I forgot or um they've been really challenging today I couldn't I couldn't cope I had to get out of the house so you get those dynamics are very very complicated very difficult to um pin down yeah we get family gatekeeping so concerned family members are sort of blocked out get a lot of calls to helpline you know I'm really worried about my neighbour or my elderly uncle but you know this is happening that's happening somebody phoned up about um, their uncle elderly uncle that had um, a her, his masseur, masseur ended up moving in with him and suddenly was providing him not only with her with care um, but also was administering insulin for him um, and very shortly after she moved in and obviously the wills was changed over uh, I was told um, he started having episodes of clarity and so there's a kind of a suspicion on uh, insulin abuse going on so you know again easily deniable we're in a relationship um, the elderly uncle was convinced he was in a relationship you know and he was supporting this lady and so very very complicated scenarios um, very often cost considerations are prioritized above well-being um, medication abu abuse abuse um, linked to mental capacity so that's a very easy one to uh, manipulate um, with dementia you we get perpetrators with dementia or alleged perpetrators with dementia um, whether or not that's even a thing I don't even know whether that's technically possible to be a perpetrator if you have dementia but um, but we also see the um, the victims with dementia as well um, and so that's you know in fact I've later on I've got a little slide about dementia things just to look out for um, so this is quite a big one actually service providers are quite easily gaslit by the um, Per, alleged perpetrator and that's often to do with this sort of disguised attentiveness um you know we're all struggling with time and funding and you know capacity and so when you've got a really sort of supposedly what on all to all intents purposes looks like a really supportive uh, individual caring for their family member it's you know it's not anybody's fault where that's kind of taken up you know that that kind of assistance is is um taken up and maybe people aren't as watchful so that's a really really difficult one so um anyway so yeah so I, I just put some slides in sort of what what do we what do you do because obviously I've painted a picture as to um this kind of domestic abuse that happens with older people it's so difficult to identify what it even is um, but what do you do if you suspect abuse or neglect um, I would just say that very often the family member will um, sorry very often the um, victim will only really want support for their family member so they'll deflect you and they'll say no 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 I'm fine it's um, my you know adult daughter that's got alcohol issues or you know if you could only get help for them then everything would be fine um, and whilst that's not our remit because obviously we we support the victims of domestic abuse not the um, perpetrators but um, it, I would use that as a hook to actually open up a discussion with people because if you know that they are looking for a solution for their family member on some deeper level they're acknowledging that there's a problem so you can kind of use that to sort of hook into um, opening a conversation with them. So if there is a disclosure, um, obviously immediately um, you can reassure people. 
there's a lot of fear um that sort of mis misunderstanding or not not being aware of what the system is and how things work um i'll get people being absolutely petrified that they will be put in a home or their family member will be put in a home or their son will be arrested you know will he go to prison things like that so um you know reassurance is, is quite a big big thing for them they are absolutely petrified these victims you know they it's taken all their guts to open up so um yeah reassurance is a really big one um obviously with immediate risk there's the police or specialist domestic abuse service uh, that can be um contacted depending on context um you can give immediate advice you know it might be that um, when you're having the conversation, they're in a cafe with you and you could say, well, you know, and, and maybe, oh, I don't want to go home because, you know, he's going to really kick off. Maybe establish a place you can take them, which is safe for them. So immediately you can sort of give advice around safety. Um, and also obviously raise a safeguarding concern with Surrey County Council. And there's a link down there. Uh, so if it doesn't meet threshold which obviously is a, not a very nice terminology really um but um i do often recommend when people phone into the helpline i do often recommend that the people link into adult social care um to report a safeguarding concern so under section 42 of the care act um any adult in surrey with care and support needs and is experiencing or at risk of abuse or neglect, plus as a result of their care and support needs is unable to protect themselves against that abuse or neglect. Um, obviously, depending on level um, and assessment, um, if it triggers, if it's high enough, the level, then section 42 of the Care Act, an investigation will, um, will happen. And then obviously adult social care will look into it uh, contact all the different agencies and provide you know um, assessments if necessary and ongoing care um, and there is you don't need to to uh, get consent for that so you can immediately you can ring them up you can have a conversation with them it's a fairly straightforward thing to do um, but actually, if thresholds aren't met, there's a lot you can do, which well, I kind of thought I'd, might be helpful for you today, as it's such a difficult thing to get um, put your finger on what's going on, um, just to give you some ideas of what you can actually do. Um, immediately, there's probably stuff you can consider that will bring the temperature down within the family home. Um, you know, and obviously that depends on the situation. Um, a multi-agency risk assessment conference the marac that's really good for if there's if things are sort of escalating um it hasn't reached um sort of thresholds yet but you feel that actually this is going somewhere then um you know depending on on um how you feel about that then there's always that you can consider the marac um with consent you can apply for a carer's assessment or a care needs assessment and even just talking to somebody around the fact that this assessment can be done will bring I'm sure a lot of you will will do these anyway as a matter of course but um you know that that can really make people feel reassured uh sometimes advocating for clients is all that is needed I mean I'm I work a lot of I spend a lot of my time far too much time on the phone to housing departments, um, trying to find out, you know, uh, when their front door is going to be fixed or, um, you know, some repair to the family home, um, you know, <laughs> which is uh, really frustrating. But the, again, back to clients, they have, um, I've, I've spoken to clients before where they've had their sons been arrested and the uh, adult, the parents to the adult son were knew that the son had been sort of um it was an alcohol related issue but knew that the son had been put through for um some sort of a scheme but they didn't know what it was and they didn't know whether or not that meant he was going to prison and so sometimes just simple conversations um around 
what the situation is for them can really bring the temperature down for them. Um, obviously, there's specialist services of domestic abuse services for anything that's um, reasonably imminently needed, like injunctions or safety planning. Um, but a really, especially for the older population, I can't stress enough, and I'm sure they spend a lot of the time with the GPs anyway, but I can't stress enough how helpful referrals into or, or you know, being connected back to their GP um, can be absolutely, you know, radically change the situation. Um, sometimes they just need access to social prescribers, access to sort of being out there in the community, uh, getting them out of the house. You know, this is this might be themselves, the victim, getting the victim out of the house because they might have a loved one that is, um, you know, uh, has dementia, but spends most of the time at home or I've worked with people with adult uh, children who are on the autistic spectrum which who refuse to go out or won't go out but the you know the victim can be helped a lot by just getting them out of the house getting them back into society joining church groups things like that um, that can be really transformative for them um, so yeah, some sort of community support. It might be actually that the um, the perpetrator that has uh, dementia, it might be that they um, can have support within the community as well. You know, some sort of um, daily sort of group um, place to go to or for a cup of tea or whatever. Uh, befriending, um, yeah, often very, very simple issues being resolved can really massively bring the temperature down for them. Um, and this isn't something we would do because obviously we don't get involved in alleged perpetrators situation, but actually it might be that you can identify that there's some really easy thing that can be assisted. It might be mental health support for the family member that's perpetrating the abuse. So it might be that, you know, you can sort of line something up, up like that, which will massively help uh, the situation. Uh, and obviously phone out, phone hourglass you know we have um uh we have our 24 hour helpline so we will always give advice to people um as well so i mentioned earlier the sort of professional barriers really or our own barriers that we we inadvertently um create um and it's not it's, it's nobody's fault, no one's doing anything wrong. It's largely due to the fact that the elder abuse or abuse of older people is so difficult to pinpoint what it is, you know, and it really does leave a big wide open gap for um, professionals to kind of walk straight through the gap really and, and not really even realise. Um, so I think really professionally it's really difficult when you know that there's this volatile situation just pinpointing what the situation is because as I've said to you before what the situation is one week might be completely different the next week you know things changed all the time um Pandora's box you know who wants to open Pandora's box so that can be really difficult um our own personal belief that they won't want to to leave that might be um the reason why they um well we you know that your own beliefs um you get complicated issues around family members wanting to support the perpetrator other family members and so there's disagreement among the siblings um younger people often think of domestic abuse as people being in a relationship and they don't really think that it is just domestic abuse um, rape within a marriage has only been illegal for in recent years. Very complicated scenarios. Um, frequently, uh, they only want to help their family member and they'll say that they're not being abused. Um, don't assume that they want to stay or that they want to leave. Um, and yeah, they're very. It's, it's basically easier just to keep things as they are. Um, so what you can do in your day-to-day -day environment, you can always call our helpline. There's always um, DA leads in, service, in bigger self-service providers. Uh, be mindful of your language, as I've said before. 
consider care needs. Um, things can be very easily improved with, with care needs uh, being supported, opening up conversations. Um, don't assume a situation, a solution is being sought. A health really is transformative, so a health referral can be really helpful. Um, and don't really assume that the abuse is due to the care needs because it very likely isn't. Um, very quickly, because I know we're kind of running a little bit late. Um, dementia and domestic abuse. Um, so the sort of highlight out of this, I would say, is um, a lot of people will say, victims will say, oh, no, no, it's not abusive, it's the dementia. So being sensitive around that. Um, and if you have a somebody you suspect is a victim of dementia, uh, look out for changes to the scenario. So look out whether or not the alleged perpetrator is seeking to be in the room when you're talking to them, changes to lasting power of attorney or will, the house suddenly goes up for sale. Um, check You can check bank accounts. Um, isolation is, um, you can keep an eye on that. Um, change in demeanour is a good one to look out for. I'm sure you do all of this anyway in your day-to-day -day life, but un unexplained injuries and scenarios are, are also good indicators. Um, there's frequently co-caring involved, so very complicated, as I said already. Um, and what's very difficult with dementia particularly is that extended family are not in agreement about the situation. Uh, so I just put this slide in. I, would, I won't go through it, but basically, if you think that there's any um, financial abuse, C, Surviving Economic Abuse, is a really good um, organisation and they support. There's loads of stuff on their website and um, loads of advice about how you can, about banks and what, it, what different banks do to protect people from financial abuse. So contact C that they are really really good as well um, so that's just to explain we've got the national helpline which the slide is on there in a minute for the number and my job is to do things like this and also I have casework as well so that is the slide with the phone number on there we've got other ways of being contacted um, so yeah, so I'll stop sharing my screen. I'm sorry I rushed it towards the end. Um, can yeah, hang on. Right. Okay. Can you see me? We can, Sarah. Thank you. That was okay. a really, really insightful session, <laughs> and I think, like you said, there was so much around the services you provide. But you know, it's yeah. just you know looking at the signs and spotting the indicators of of abuse and you know without the data it's really hard to tell and i think like you said you kind of nailed it there with just go with your guts um it is really really difficult to kind of spot those those early indicators of abuse so no thank you very much i'm just going to go to the q a uh chat bar to see if we've got any questions we've got a question here from Catherine who's asked uh, what are the red flags to help identify elder abuse that we should be looking for when we are engaged with an older person um I, I mean obviously it's like with any domestic abuse it's um it's seeing how they are with their perpetrator uh, if if you don't see them in that context it's much more difficult to but they might be very um you know unsure of their they might have debt you know they might have too frightened to open bills and they've got debt so you can investigate that further and it might be oh no no you know my my son deals with that so um anything that kind of on the surface of it looks a bit odd to um you know um or suspicious um you know if they start asking about lasting power of attorney changes and things like that um i mean with neglect it's obviously more physical things um being appearing to be frightened around the perpetrator but I, I i honestly would say really you've probably got a feeling that there's something not quite right um and that's probably your, the, the biggest indicator of, of all really thank you sarah uh, we've got another question here from zabine is hourglass support for older people with no care and support needs 
Uh, yes, we will just support people, I say just, with domestic abuse. They don't have to have care and support needs as well. But they and do. we do need consent. That's the only thing I would say is, is you, we won't just work with them. They, they do need to consent to being worked with. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, Parvin's just commented saying, uh, could we have a copy of the slides with the links and numbers? Uh, we will be publishing the slides available on our website so you'll be able to download the, the presentation deck and watch uh, the whole session um, as we have recorded it. So that will be soon made available on our website, uh, Parvin. Uh, are there any other questions for Sarah while we still have her? <laughs> I can't see anything popping into the uh, chat bar, Sarah, so I think we'll we'll call it there. But um, if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to either contact the board or contact Sarah. Um, I could uh, provide you with Sarah's details if, if that's all right, Sarah. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Yeah. And um, we will be publishing uh, this session on our website, like I said. Um, so if you have missed anything and want to recap um, on anything Sarah has kind of given us an insight into today, um, we will shortly publish these um, on our website. So um, don't feel free, like you'll uh, don't feel as though you're losing out on uh, any of the information shared today um, because it is very valuable. Um, there is an opportunity to provide feedback on today's session. So if you have a look on the Q&A, uh, bar on on the teams uh, teams app you'll be able to kind of provide feedback for Sarah which I'll be able to share with her um our next session uh that will be delivered will be just after the Easter break and that will be delivered by the fire services uh from Surrey so if you do want to book your slot you can have a look on our webinar series page on our website um and you can book your slot and Debbie has just commented to say, very interesting, thank you. So thank you for your comments, Debbie. All right, well, I'm going to close it there. So uh, thank you all again, and uh, a massive thank you to Sarah as well again. So really appreciate your time today. Thank okay. you, everybody. Thanks for having me. Cheerio, everyone.